Karen, thank you for reading for us. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are there and you are not silent, that you have spoken to us through your Son, through your Word. And we pray as we come to that Word this morning, uh, you would enlighten our minds, warm our hearts, uh, and encourage us to love him and serve him more. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, Amos uh, is sometimes referred to as one of the minor prophets. Uh, That's not because he was uh, underage, under the age of majority, or indeed that he's less important uh, than the so-called major prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel. It's simply because he's shorter. It's a shorter book, and that makes him very hard to find. Um, So if you've closed your Bibles, it's page 916 in the church Bibles. Uh, And if you're using a different one, I say look at the content contents that's what it's there for as I say it's short it's only a few pages Uh, but this morning what I want to do is just uh, give us a bit of a taster really um, because we're going to be in the book of Amos in the next few Sundays over the summer that's another advantage of it being a small book you can uh, do most of it in a short period of time Uh, this morning we're going to start at start at the very beginning which I'm given to understand is a very good place to start And what we're going to do is just look at the opening two verses that introduce the man and his message. Let me read them to you again. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up. The top of Carmel withers. Now, it's helpful as we begin, I think, to have uh, the right kind of expectation. Now, my guess is that many of us, perhaps most of us here this morning, won't have a great deal of expectation as we come to, or at least not maybe very positive ones, as we contemplate a series of Sunday mornings working through an Old Testament prophet. And I get that, really. It's an old book, isn't it? It's a very old book, 3,000 years or so old, written to another people in a very different time, long, long ago, far, far away. And we might think, you know, are there not more pressing, more important issues and things we could be looking at, more significant ones? I mean, there are loads of questions that demand our attention, aren't there? Could we not be better spending our time considering them? I mean, our time together on Sunday morning is very short. It's very precious. It's soon over. Is this really a good way to spend our time together? I mean, because it's not a book without difficulties, as we'll see in the coming weeks. We'll look at some of them. And it's not as though it's a book that's predicting things that are going to happen in our time. Some some people think the prophets are like that, and they look for uh, uh, things that the the prophet said would happen in our own time, in our future. It's not that. That's not what the prophets are like. They don't do that. They don't speak directly to events in our own time. Well, Then what should we expect to hear as we open the pages? Well, keep a finger in Amos and turn over, will you, to our second reading this morning in Romans. And listen to the words of Paul as I read them again. Words that he writes as he introduces himself to a church that doesn't know him, but who he wants to get to know him, to support him in his ministry. He doesn't know them, he's going to go there, and he wants them to know about him. And he writes, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. The gospel he promised through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures here referring to the Jewish Scriptures, our Old Testament, and Amos 
is one of the prophets that Paul's referring to. What the prophets did for the Roman church then, they do for us now. And what Amos will do for us over the next few weeks, if we attend to his words, the words of this book, what it will do will be introduce us to and help, help us understand better the gospel of God, God and his purposes in the world. Purposes that have Jesus right at the centre of things. And friends, there's, there's nothing more important or more pressing for us to spend our time looking at when we gather together. Nothing, nothing more urgent than that. Nothing actually that will help us face better the other concerns we feel pressing on us than a greater, a deeper understanding of God and his purposes revealed to us in the Lord Jesus. Understanding what he's doing in the world when we consider those other issues that we face uh, will keep us on the right track. Because God has a purpose. History has a purpose. Your history, my history, our lives have purpose. And God knows what he's doing. And indeed, he shows us what he's doing in the person of work of Christ. And the words of Amos will help us better understand what that is. Why? Well, because Amos is God's prophet. And therefore, if we listen to him, we hear the very words of God. So as we read and understand his words, we're reading and understanding the words of God to us, learning his purposes, learning of Jesus Christ, what he has done, what he will do. Because the news of the gospel, as Paul says, is that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the promises and purposes of God revealed to us in the Old Testament scriptures. And so now, hopefully, with our expectations rightly aligned, let's turn back and have a look at Amos. We're just going to say we're just going to look at those first two verses. Uh, verses that introduce us to Amos, the man, and his message. The man and his message. So firstly, let's consider Amos, the man, verse 1. Well, verse 1 introduces us to Amos, doesn't he? Uh, we, what do we learn about him? Well, we don't learn a lot, actually. We're not told much. But what we are told is actually very helpful. We learn who he was. We learn when he was. And we learn why he matters. Who he was, when he was, and why he matters. First, so first, who was he? Well, there's no backstory. We don't get any of that. We're told simply that he was one of the shepherds of Tekoa. So Amos was a shepherd. Now, whatever image you now have in your mind of Amos the shepherd, shepherd, it's probably the wrong one. The word for shepherd here is not the usual Hebrew word for shepherd, I'm told. I know no Hebrew, I'm told by those who do. It actually only occurs once, one other place in the Old Testament, uh, and that's in 2 Kings 3, verse 4, where it's applied to a king, the king of Moab. And what becomes clear as you read the account there of the king of Moab is that the king of Moab is a rather successful sheep breeder. At one point, he gives 100,000 lambs and, 100, 000, and the wool of 100,000 rams to the king of Israel. So we can't be 100% certain, but it seems likely, probable even, that rather than being a sort of simple country soul with a few sheep, a handful of sheep, it's likely that Amos is actually a rather successful businessman, a wealthy citizen of Tekoa. And that seems to be confirmed later on in the book, in chapter 7. We won't look at it now, but in chapter 7, uh, there's a conversation between Amos and someone else called Amaziah. And it becomes clear that Amaziah is no fan of Amos uh, or his message. And that, that often goes together, doesn't it? And Amaziah wants Amos to get lost, to go back to where he's come from, basically to shut up and go away. And Amos replies to Amaziah, 
He says, hang on, Amaziah, it's not my fault. It's not my message. Don't get angry with me. I, I wasn't a prophet. I wasn't the son of a prophet. I was a shepherd. And I was quite happy looking after my business, my sheep, and my sycamore trees. So it seems that he had a sideline in figs as well as his sheep. It was the Lord that sent me here, he says. So it seems that he's a, quite a successful sheep breeder back in Tekoa with a side hustle in figs. In fact, Amos describing himself as a shepherd is a bit like the late Queen Elizabeth describing, her, describing this building. Anyone recognize it? Yeah, it's Balmoral, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if you saw the clip in Sky News around the time of the, the Queen's funeral uh, that tells a story when she and her protection officer were out, uh, out in, in the, the estate and they pranked some American tourists. Do you hear that? The, the tourists didn't recognize her uh, and they played a game on her. If, if you've not seen it, Google um, QE2 tourist prank and it's the first video there. But it, it, basically, she describes Balmoral uh, as her country home, country, uh, 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 a country cottage, rather. So uh, that's a by the by, really. But a Amos was not a normal shepherd, okay? He lived in Tekoa, uh, south, uh, uh, five miles south of Bethlehem, about 10 miles south of Jerusalem in Judah. Uh, that small bit of the old nation, and that will become important later on, and we'll get on to that. But that's pretty much all we know about Amos, actually. He was a sheep breeder from Tekoa. Although we do know something else, if you look at it, we also know when he was, verse 1. It was two years before the earthquake. Which earthquake, you ask? Well, the earthquake, of course. And if that doesn't help you pinpoint it, it would have helped the original hearers. A few months back, some of, you, some of us met Jay Bean. He was with us uh, just for a week. He's uh, the Bishop of the Church confessing, of Confessing Anglicans in New Zealand. And he and his family were caught up in the Christchurch earthquake. I think it was of 2010-11. Uh, it destroyed his house and it destroyed his church. That, that's not his house or his church, but that's just um, a couple of pictures of the internet. <clears throat> Speak to him about the earthquake and there's no doubt about which earthquake you're referring to. So Amos's earthquake here is clearly a significant earthquake, and indeed it's referred to by Zechariah in the book in chapter 14. And that suggests that this book covers a relatively short period, well, maybe of a few months, in a very identifiable time. In fact, we learn exactly when it was, verse 1, don't we? It was the time when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. Now, these two kings, their reigns overlapped. <clears throat> um, uh, Uzziah reigned from about 780 to 740 BC in Judah, the southern part of the old Israel kingdom, which, which is really small, just a remnant, a runt, really, of that once great nation, uh, ruled over by David and his son Solomon. Israel had been a magnificent, remember the, the story of the Queen of Sheba, how everyone came to see uh, Solomon and, and marvel at, 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 at the power and the prosperity of, of the nation uh, that he ruled. Well, if you know the story, that didn't last. And after Solomon's death, uh, the nation split into two to the larger northern Israel bit, much larger, and that kept the name Israel. Uh, and the smaller, much smaller southern bits, which was known as Judah. It was a very small, but it remained very significant because it contained Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, uh, the old capital, and it contained the temple, the one that Solomon built. And David's descendants continued to reign. So all that was in the south, Meanwhile, Jeroboam, Jeroboam II, was king of the much larger northern kingdom. 
And if we were to go back uh, to look at the history books in the Old Testament, one and two Kings, one and two Chronicles, and read the prophets, one thing would become clear about this time in Israel's history, the time that Amos is writing, at the time of the reign of these two kings. What would become clear is that it was a very unusual time. For most of the history, uh, Old Testament history, these two nations, Judah and Israel, are at war. They're either at war with enemies without, or they're at war with, with each other. They're always fighting someone, but for a few brief pauses, and this is one of them. When Amos is speaking, it's peaceful. Peace has broken out, and as a result, the nations are doing quite well. They're prosperous, but it's an untypical time. Israel's borders were back to which they had been under the Halston days of David and Solomon. There was peace, there was prosperity. And this is when Amos was speaking his message. So we've seen who he was, we've seen when he was, but the question remains, doesn't it, so what? You know, why does any of that matter? Well, that's a very reasonable question, I think, as I've said already. But to answer that, or at least begin to answer it, in fact, verse 1 begins to answer it, it makes clear that what we have before us are the words of Amos, that's clear. But it's not Amos who matters. We don't really learn any more about him. What follows is not the life and times of Amos. Because what matters are his words. And that's perhaps one of the reasons we know so little about him. What, from this point onward, Amos falls into the background and what is forefronted are his words. And the significance of his words, his message. What matters not, not, is not them, the prophets, and their story. What matters is their words. What do we learn about Amos's words, verse 1? It's a slightly odd phrase, actually. NIV, the words of Amos, the vision he saw. Or as ESV has it, the words of Amos which he saw. Words of vision. His words came to him in a vision, a God-given vision. And therefore, the words recorded for us here, Amos's words, are not ultimately his words, but the words that he saw from God. They're God's words recorded for us, and that's why they matter. So here's the claim, and it is an extraordinary one if you step back and think about it for a moment. And on one level, you can take it or leave it although I suggest that you don't leave it, but take it and take it very seriously. There was a time about 760 BC when a man called Amos from Tekoa, there down in the south, traveled north to Israel. He goes to them and claims that God has given him a word for them. Now, Amaziah, as we've seen already this morning, doesn't like what he's got to say. He says, get out, go back to your own plan. But even before we look at what he said, is it surprising that the folk in the north weren't terribly keen to hear what he had to say? So we've issued to, uh, uh, we've introduced to Amos who he was, when he was, why he matters. Secondly, uh, we're introduced to his message uh, which, as we've seen, is the far more important bit. What was his message? Verse 2. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. Four quick things to note, very briefly. Four things that will help orientate us to what's, what's to come in the coming weeks. Firstly, he tells us, the Lord roars from Zion. Now, for someone, you'll know that when Lord is written like that in capital, capital letters, it's referring to Yahweh, it's God's name, the name he revealed to Moses back in Exodus at the beginning in the burning bush. Yahweh, he is, or he will be. Rather enigmatic word, but a name that is given content in which what follows in Exodus, where we learn who is like, 
what he's like, what he does, his character, his purposes. It's this Lord who reveals his name to Moses as to no one else, who reveals to his name to Israel as to no other nation. Israel has the enormous privilege of knowing God by name, the true and living God. And in the entire history of the world, no other nation has ever been given such a privilege. And there's never been such a great a privilege in all of human history. It has only ever been surpassed by us who know God's name, the name that is above every name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess. By those of us who know the gospel of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the book begins with the name of the Lord. His message, Amos's message, is a word from God. It comes with God's signature, if you like. That's the first thing we learn about his message, a word from the Lord. The second thing we learn about his message, again from verse 2, do you see? This word comes, or well, not as a whisper, or as a quiet suggestion. It comes as a roar. The Lord roars. It's not a quiet word. It's not a cosy one. Listen to Amos and you will hear God roar. As a lion about to pounce on its prey, his voice thunders from Jerusalem. The Lord roars. Words that cannot be ignored. Well, I suppose they can, really. But not because they've not been heard. God's roar demands a hearing. Something is happening. God is saying something. God is doing something. And we do well to listen. The sovereign Lord has spoken, who will not fear. The third thing we learn about Amos' message, again from verse 2, is where the word of God comes from. You see, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. Zion, Jerusalem, two names for the same place, the capital of Judah down there in the south. So here is Amos comes from the south with a message from its capital to those in the north, a southerner from Tekoa, a posh southern businessman with his la di -da accent, heads north to tell the locals what for. Is it a surprise they didn't welcome him with open arms? But there's more going on here than just petty regional jealousy. Zion, Jerusalem, was not only the capital of Judah, it was where the temple was, the house for God's name, built by the great King Solomon, as we've said, at the height of his fame, where Yahweh symbolically dwelt, where the Psalms were sung, Psalms like the one we started our time together this morning, Psalm 99. Let me read the opening verses to you again. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion, he is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob you have done right what is just and right. Exalt the Lord your God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. The lion roars from Zion. The earth shakes. Let the nations tremble. Lastly, fourthly, from verse 2, the fourth thing we learn about his message is the effect of that roar. The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top 
of Carmel with us. Top of Carmel. Carmel is a large mountain. It's on, on the west uh, of the northern kingdom by the Mediterranean Sea near the coast. You may remember it's where Elijah had his run in with the prophets of Baal, where there were all, loads of altars to foreign gods. Carmel with us. The pastures of the shepherds, the pastures that's sort of the land in between, the lush, the green pastures, the large fertile areas of the northern kingdom, now prosperous and at peace under the long and successful reign of Jeroboam. Well, all that is about to get end. The pastures of the shepherds dry up. The top of Carmel withers. All will shrivel. All will perish. None of what you see around you will last. All will be destroyed. The roar of the lion will bring an end to it all. Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking, listening to the roar of the Lord, the shout of the lion, and reflect on its huge significance. But by way of introduction, as, as we close, note, will you, that the roar of the lion in those days, way, way back then, back in the 8th century BC, the roar of the lion has not fallen silent the Lord continues to roar from Zion. And God's word today, as then, was, is, not a quiet suggestion. A take it or leave it thought for today. In the past, God spoke to his people in many and various ways, through the prophets, prophets like Amos. That's how the writer of the Hebrew puts it, doesn't he? But now, in these last days, days between Jesus' resurrection and his coming again, he has spoken to us by his son. A son who came to that same northern region in Israel that Amos spoke to 750 years earlier. And it's a word of God that comes proclaiming the gospel. Do you remember how Mark put it, the time is fulfilled. Indeed, how Jesus put it, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. The king is here. Repent and believe the gospel. Just turn over a page to Amos 3, will you, for a moment. Very briefly, verse 4. Where Amos helps us see the consequences of the fact that God has shouted. Verse 4, does a lion roar in the thicket when it has no prey? Does it growl in its den when it has caught nothing? God's shout, his roar, is not about nothing. You hear the lion roar, you know something is happening. You know something's going on. And so it is when God shouts. Verse 8, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken. God has spoken to us by his son. He has spoken to you by his son. Who will not fear? Who will not tremble? The roar of the lion is not silent. Something is happening. Don't ignore it. Let's pray together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you that you are not silent. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we hear your word, as we hear the roar of Amos' message in the coming weeks, that we would come to understand how, it, how its message is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. And that our only hope in the face of a Lord who roars is to flee to his son.